Hello. Uh, depending where you are on the planet, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name's um, James Roby, and I lead the environmental sustainability agenda for Capgemini. We're delighted that you can join us today as we uh, spend some time thinking about artificial intelligence and how artificial intelligence can power your climate change strategy. Delighted to be um, uh, joined today by um, three guests, uh, David Rolnick, Han Hannah Helmke, and Cyril Garcia. And it's been a really interesting week for sustainability and AI. I think um, sustainability is now in the news pretty much every day. But yesterday, there was a really interesting piece on the news about um, a company called DeepMind and some research they've done on protein folding. And one of the interesting side effects of that research is the uh, potential to um, design enzymes which will actually eat plastic, um, a huge sustainability challenge. So uh, very topical that we are together this week, um, looking at the latest report from the Capgemini Research Institute, looking at this really important topic. I'd like to start by uh, giving, giving, the, uh, giving my panelists the quick opportunity to introduce themselves and explain uh, who they work for and their, their link to AI. And then we will um, open into a conversation unpacking some of the findings from the report and, uh, and the panelists' experience working in this space. So let me start with, um, with David. Hi, everyone. My name is David Rolnick, and I'm an assistant professor of computer science at McGill University in the Mila Quebec AI Institute. I'm also co-founder and chair of Climate Change AI uh, and scientific co-director of sustainability in the digital age. Great. And now can I hand over to Hannah? Hello, my name is Hannah. I'm co-founder and managing director of Right Based on Science, which is a German-based young company providing temperature alignment analysis and methodologies. And we had the pleasure to collaborate with Capgemini on the study that is the subject of today's panel. Fantastic. Thank you. And finally, hand over to Cyril. Hello, my name is Cyril Garcia. I'm the Global Head of Sustainability for the Capgemini Group. And I have uh, as well the pleasure to be the CEO of Capgemini Invent. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Cyril. So let's um, let's start by diving into the topic a little bit. And perhaps, David, you've been working in this area, researching AI and machine learning and climate change for a while. So perhaps could you provide some, some background and briefing from, from your perspective? Absolutely. So maybe it will be useful to have a bit of context on what AI actually means. We hear many of these terms thrown around, uh, thrown around now increasingly often. So AI can really refer to any algorithm that enables a computer to perform complicated tasks. Um, and there is a lot of AI now that is specifically referring to machine learning, which is algorithms that are able to learn what to do from data. So you don't say exactly what to do. You don't tell the computer exactly how to, how to behave. The computer, to some extent, works that out by looking at patterns in the data. Um, so um, there has been a lot, of, uh, a lot of work lately, many breakthroughs in machine learning that have led to the increased popularity of AI across, across sectors, really across society. Um, and maybe it's, it's worthwhile thinking about some of the strengths and weaknesses of machine learning and AI more broadly. Um, some of the strengths are really performing simple tasks uh, quickly and automatically. So if you want to perform a task slightly worse than a human and much faster, that can often be a good situation to use machine learning and AI. Uh, finding patterns in big data sets. Um, and optimizing complicated systems where there are lots of knobs to turn and a human might not be able to see or understand all of the ways that you can influence your system. Um, and those are some of the strengths. Uh, some of the weaknesses are that it's sensitive to, to bad or biased data. So if you have data that is inaccurate or biased um, either deliberately or uh, generally by accident, um, the machine learning or AI algorithms that learn from that data will perpetuate those biases, sometimes in a way that makes it seem objective. Um, because you know, if you have this impartial algorithm, how is it going to be biased? Well, if you fed it data that's biased, then it will be biased. Um, they're also bad at generalizing if the data changes. So if you have data that's, that's coming in, which is different from the data that the algorithm learned from, then you're going to run into a problem. Um, and also, it generally doesn't find causal relationships. It finds correlation, not causation. So it's not telling you necessarily why something's true. It's telling you that it thinks it's true. 
Um, so with all that being said about what machine learning and AI actually actually are, maybe we can turn to some of the, the applications that are relevant to, to climate change problems. And so there are a couple of different areas uh, of climate change action. There's mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and there's adaptation, which is responding to the effects of climate change. And really both are necessary, um, as many of the effects of climate change are at this point inevitable. We get to decide exactly how bad it is, but we need both mitigation, reducing the effects, and adaptation, adapting to those effects. Um, so some of the some of the overall themes that one sees in how machine learning can be useful uh, in climate change mitigation and adaptation are first of all improved efficiency. Uh, so. Uh, optimization or control of complicated systems. So some examples of this are, for example, temperature control, where you have a building or an industrial process that needs to be kept at a specific temperature um, or at a range of temperatures, depending upon use. Um, and uh, an AI system can learn to control the temperature much more efficiently than a human might be able to. So Google famously did this with their, their data centers recently, saving them a lot of energy because they were able to control the temperature much more efficiently. Likewise for energy use in various industrial processes. Um, supply chain optimization is another situation where one really has a lot of knobs to turn and one can just perform uh, tasks much more efficiently uh, if one has access to an automated system. Often. And then uh, demand response, so uh, tweaking demand on the electrical grid so that it matches up with when the supply of electricity is more abundant or lower carbon intensity. Um, that's really important as we have more variable sources of electricity on the grid, like solar and wind power, that um, are coming at different times of the day or night. So timing demand where possible, so charging your electric vehicle or performing a task that could be done at any time of the day to make sure that it lines up with when electricity is most abundant and least carbon intensive. Um, the, the second, that was the first theme for, for um, machine learning, I've got three here. So the second theme is getting actionable insights from, from, from data. Um, and here, many of the applications come from taking a really big data set that's really unstructured and using machine learning to get something useful out of that, whether for a, 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 a more informed policy or for, for other decisions that can be made in a data-driven way. Um, and some examples of this include processing satellite imagery. So uh, machine learning AI are very good at processing images automatically, whether that's labeling your photo of a cat or taking a look at satellite imagery and pinpointing the flood risk to various, uh, to various parts of a city or forecasting agricultural yield on the basis of vegetation cover, doing all of this autom automatically to guide uh, decisions and really provide insights that wouldn't be as scalable were it not for this automated approach. A couple of other examples here are pinpointing methane emissions uh, using hyperspectral imagery, uh, methane being a more significant greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide itself, um, and also predictive maintenance. So there are a lot of infrastructure uh, issues that can be forestalled, uh, prevented, um, if they are pinpointed in advance. So understanding when failure will occur of critical infrastructure, which is particularly important um, in a climate change adaptation context as infrastructure becomes threatened by extreme weather, for example. Um, so again, first uh, overall theme, improved efficiency. Second overall theme, actionable insights from data. Third theme that I want to touch on is innovative design. Um, so this can be recommendations for which experiments to try, not, not uh, replacing the process of experimentation itself, but really augmenting human intuition in that regard. So some examples here are designing new materials for batteries or electrofuels or solar perovskites. Um, so suggesting exper uh, experiments that could be tried with new materials to design better better materials or aerodynamic vehicle design, for example. There are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, different applications here where machine learning and AI are already being applied. And in general, I want, I want to to, to call attention to the fact that most of these applications, the AI is really, it's ready to be used. This is not pie in the sky future, future research. There is future research that can make this better, but the AI algorithms are currently ready for use in most of these applications. Um, and then just to, just to close, I wanna emphasize that machine learning and AI are really just one tool in one's toolkit here. In every situation, they need to be used in conjunction with other strategies and with other kinds of expertise, uh, which are complementary to the, to the AI itself. Um, and 
also that AI is neither intrinsically good nor bad. There are applications of AI that are making climate change worse, definitely. Um, for example, applications of AI that are uh, accelerating oil and gas exploration and thereby really increasing carbon dioxide emissions while reducing the competitiveness of um, the comparative competitiveness of, of, of um, renewable energy. Um, and then there are also applications of AI that are have uncertain impacts. So like autonomous vehicles, for example, which make driving more efficient, but will probably lead to more driving. And so it's generally thought that autonomous vehicles, so self-driving cars will actually be a net contributor to climate change because they will probably cause a net increase in consumption. This is called rebound effect or Jevons paradox. Um, and so really it's very complicated and one needs to understand exactly what the impacts of what one's going to be, what one's going to be working on are. Um, and then also in some cases for the particularly large AI models, there can be an energy impact themselves of running the model. Now, many or maybe even most AI models are pretty lightweight. I run my AI models on my laptop but um, if one's using one of these really big models, one also should be aware of that. Thanks, David. That's really interesting. I was uh, talking to a colleague in the US who just spent 17 hours driving uh, to get home for Thanksgiving and uh, was very interested in the idea of a, an algorithm which would uh, uh, autonomously do all the driving for him to save, uh, to save uh, the risks and dangers of driving that long on your own. So I think that echoes beautifully some of the findings of the, um, the Capgemini AI, um, climate AI report. Uh, the first one being that there are clearly lots of use cases, lots of case studies where um, AI can be making a real meaningful difference in terms of uh, climate change action. And, and secondly, that some of those use cases are, are actually in, in production already making a difference. Cyril, can I hand over to you to perhaps um, uh, unpack some of those a little and share some of the experiences from, from the business in this area? Yes, absolutely, uh, James, sorry, Dr. James Ruby, I should say. And, and I'd like to thank uh, David for, for your introduction because, in fact, you have uh, uh, designed a fantastic picture of what is the, the potential of, uh, of uh, AI in the context of the climate change. And that's, uh, that's the right moment to, to enter in this conversation because for the people who are in technology, you know that for years we are... Uh, uh, claiming a promising uh, a kind of gen generic impact of uh, of ai but now it's for real and it's uh, and it's for good uh, at least in the in the frame of the uh, on the of the environment and uh, and the energy uh, transition so at capgemini i i like to borrow this uh, this uh, this phrase from uh, from james which is we really consider that uh, the the ai has the potential to uh, turbocharge net zero efforts and uh, let's be concrete about it we just uh, released you know we are passionate about those topics at, at capgemini with with very strong expert we released an, a study uh, with a partner uh, the gates fund uh, called net uh, fit for net zero in which we showed the impact uh, how in Europe, at least, we could be able to uh, to reduce by 50% uh, our uh, carbon footprint uh, by 2050, leveraging uh, key technologies. And guess what? All those technologies are fed uh, by uh, by AI. I just take uh, the example that David mentioned on the intelligent uh, energy uh, grids. AI, of course, can help and improve predictions of how much electricity we need. If we are going to rely on more, uh, I would say, renewable energy sources, and that's for sure, utilities will need better ways of predicting how much energy uh, is needed in real time and over the, the, the long term. And this, uh, this, uh, this has uh, an impact in terms that we can measure, it's concrete, assess in terms of uh, millions of uh, uh, tons of CO2 uh, to have the exact uh, number you can ping uh, gems, but it's, it has been, uh, this calculation has been made line by line, and it's the, we, ca we can count it by, uh, by millions. Uh, and, and this is a very, uh, you know, we, smart grid is not something new, frankly. Uh, there are historical players in space, uh, you know, the, the, the Schneider, the, 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 the Telvent, and so So it means that all algorithms uh, already uh, exist that can, uh, forecast energy demand, but they could be improved by uh, considering final local weather and and uh, and climate patterns, or or uh, more importantly, maybe uh, household uh, uh, behaviors. So this is this is one domain, and with a very concrete impact. I think the 
the, the, the enabling more energy efficient building is the big, big challenge because that's where today the, 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 the carbon footprint is, uh, is, uh, is much needed. So, yes, intelligent control systems can dramatically reduce a, a building energy consumption. So, by taking weather uh, forecast and again behaviors, uh, building uh, occupancy and, uh, and uh, other uh, environmental uh, conditions. But uh, with AI, uh, uh, a smart building can and could also communicate directly with the grid to reduce how much power it is using if there's a scarcity of low carbon electricity supply at any uh, given time. So that's another, uh, that's another uh, uh, domain. Uh, I like to, to, to give another example on the, how we can create new low carbon uh, uh, materials. Uh, in this area, we know that uh, machine learning can accelerate things by finding, designing, and, and evaluating a new chemical structures with the desired uh, properties. Uh, and this, uh, the, I, li I really like this example because this uh, help, this could help for, uh, to create solar fuels which can store energy from sunlight. And storage is a key topic, or uh, identify more efficient carbon dioxide absorbance or structural materials that take a lot less carbon to, to create. So I think we are in, in the very concrete uh, uh, domain. Uh, I can give more, uh, more uh, examples. So greener transportations. Uh, uh, we know that the green vehicles, uh, uh, we can have a key strategy for decarbonizing transportations. Uh, that, that's one. Uh, we can, uh, and I know it's subject to many debates, but uh, uh, we call it make precision agriculture possible at scale. So that's uh, uh, that's that's a domain as well that we should consider, and it has an impact as well. Uh, and uh, the third element, uh, which is uh, dear to our heart, is uh, the better uh, monitoring of uh, deforestation. So we are the beginning of uh, of something. We know that uh, that deforestation contributes uh, to roughly uh, 10 percent of uh, uh, global. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Despite all of the efforts that we make uh, at Capgemini to plant trees, uh, it's not uh, it's not enough. So, so that's uh, those are the key uh, some key examples. But again, I insist on one element. Uh, so you will find in the in the high climate report the details. But I insist on one element, which is uh, now the impact uh, of innovation around the eye is uh, is me measurable. So that's that's uh, that's why. We are convinced that we are going to uh, to shift. Thanks, Cyril. That's great, Hannah. When we were talking um, last week, you were you were talking about a, a slightly different application of AI, which is in the financial sector, um, to investigate the the credibility of organisations and their uh, approaches to uh, 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 sustainability. Do you want to spend a little bit of time just unpacking you know, how how the finance sector is using AI? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So when it comes to the credibility of a company's climate program, stakeholders, and especially the financial uh, market, uh, often refers to the targets and the pledges that this company has done. So I hear quite a lot that those companies that have set a science-based target, for example, so a target that is in line with the Paris Climate Agreement, are supposed to be climate and future-proof. Um, however, that is a little bit like uh, when I say, okay, I'm a professional athlete because I have set the goal to run six times a week. Um, and now the question is, okay, do you, do you actually believe me that I'm a professional athlete or no, because I have set that goal? Um, so a validated and ambitious target is definitely something very important, but um, it is a first step only. And um, yeah, what, what, what really counts is the actual execution, is the actual implementation. So um, I believe that the focus that the financial market currently has um, on the targets is quite a dangerous bet. Um, and this is why more and more the financial community is desperately looking for so-called um, transition companies and a credible way to identify them. So a transition company is a company which is not yet Paris aligned because the business model is too emission intensive, but a transition company has actually a, a goal and a strategy to transition from a non-Paris aligned company to a Paris aligned company. So while companies are looking for ways for AI or for ways to use AI for more 
for more efficient and less resource use, um, cause less weight, etc. Um, the financial markets can use AI for determining those transition companies, which could be a safer investment in the future and which could be a better client in the future for banks because they really need capital for this transition. And um, the question or the big question is now, okay, how can we use AI for determining those companies, for identifying them and also use AI as a control mechanism, whether those companies who set a goal are really walking the talk or not. And um, using AI to find patterns, especially in the language as unstructured data of corporate communication is therefore quite an interesting use case for the financial industry. So where, for example, does the company speak about sustainability and uh, climate in the annual report? Is it just in the sustainability section or is it also in the financial and the strategy section? Um, how is it embedded into the tonality and into the language? Um, so is it something like an island component of the whole report? So is a different language used for speaking about sustainability than for speaking about other material topics? And who is speaking about it? So in whose communication is um, climate embedded and in whose communication is climate not embedded? And I think those patterns, so for example, if just a sustainability uh, officer is speaking about climate in public communication, but not the financial person and not the strategic person, not the operational person, what does it tell us about um, the credibility of a company's goal and the actual execution behind it? And I guess these, uh, I guess the, the answer to those questions might not be 100% correlated to the fact whether a company has a climate target um, or not. And this is why AI could uncover very, very interesting information for investors and bank to find the winners of the actual transition to a well below two degree world. I get the sound from you, Cyril. It's still, it's, it's still doing Hannah's speech for some reason. Something very strange is going on with the, uh, the technology. Yeah. So bef mm. before we move on to talk about barriers, um, there was a question that came in, which um, David, you might want to, uh, to share some, um, some views on. Um, somebody's put the, um, made the point that some of the training required for the AI, AI algorithms can be hugely energy intensive. Uh, I just wondered if you had any um, observations in terms of that and how it can be made yeah. more efficient. Absolutely. So this is an active area of work in, in AI, but the particular figure that was cited in the question was for pretty much the largest uh, natural language processing model uh, which is being used. It's it's one of the, the absolute largest AI models in existence, and it's only been trained a few times as far as I know in, overall in the world. Um, and that's being done by really large companies like like Google. Um, so um, most AI models are significantly smaller than that particular one, which was a transformer with neural architecture search. So as I mentioned, I train most of my AI models on my laptop, which is a, a normal laptop. Um, so I, I, I think that it's just worth bearing in mind that this is a spectrum um, and the upper end of that spectrum is very high but the lower end is perhaps more typical of what people are actually doing. But if you're using a large NLP model, you should certainly be aware of, of the, the energy requirements. And if you are a researcher in NLP in particular, it's definitely worth bearing in mind that research where you're iterating with lots of different versions of your model can be, um, can be more compute intensive. Um, but I, I, I personally am more um, concerned with the positive or negative impacts of the applications of the technology because you know like any hammer ai can be used to have a magnifier effect that's more than just its direct impact we've very much been looking as a as a, as a business recognizing that uh, you know from a pure uh, carbon and sustainability perspective you know clearly we have an impact as a as an organization with nearly 300,000 people around the world but we actually know the impact we can have is a much bigger positive impact helping our clients with their with their transformation challenges so I'd like to take us on now to, to unpack perhaps a little bit about the second theme of the report, which is about barriers. So um, one thing the report found was that there's a lot of opportunity. There's a, there are a lot of examples of how AI can make a positive difference. But actually, when you see um, how many organizations are actually using AI, the number is uh, relatively small. So perhaps I could start with Cyril just to um, explore the uh, the concept or the the what might be causing a barrier in terms of uh, 
wider adoption of AI within organizations? So, so the, the barrier concept is always a little bit an issue because it's very uh, temporary, but uh, uh, you will find in the report that uh, as we speak, only a small minority of uh, organizations, I think we, we gave the, the figure of uh, 13 or 14 percent of organizations have been able to to couple strong AI capabilities with uh, concrete uh, climate action and uh, and uh, and strategy. Uh, I will take it from the management angle because uh, David and Anna are the best, one of the best experts of the topic. Uh, I would say uh, the governance is, is important because over the last five to four to five years, we have uh, we have me, met all over the world fantastic uh, uh, AI uh, experts, but uh, in a special corner, uh, in charge of innovation, uh, having a say on the business, but not too much. So it's shifting. So I think that uh, uh, the, the the key topic today is that the the the, the, the CSR, the chief uh, social uh, CSO, chief social officer, chief social responsibility officer, or chief sustainability uh, officer should be at the level of uh, of content that the, the 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 cdo chief digital officers were in the previous revolution the digital revolution and at cap gemini we really consider that uh, the the green uh, is the new digital and ai is uh, is the main uh, is the main lever so we should think about this uh, this governance but for that uh, i think you you mentioned it uh, uh, anna uh, each and every one should know by heart the content of the Par Paris Agreement and the importance of it, uh, not only in the citizen life, but in the company's life. So I think there is a, there's a connection, a strategic and political connection that should lead to a better way to consider the, the, the governance uh, in the, in the uh, organizations. Uh, and, then, and then I think we have a, a, and the last figure that is very interesting in the study is that at the end of the day, if we see something, if we say, okay, something is happening, uh, we have today a meager 3%, uh, James, 3 or of, 3 of 5% of use cases which have been fully uh, scaled, uh, according to the, the interviews that have been uh, led. Uh, so, uh, usual suspect are uh, money, uh, so, so uh, uh, more than 80% spend less than uh, 5% of their climate change investment towards uh, AI-led uh, use cases. So that's uh, no, no, no surprise. And uh, I think the big topic, but it's, it, will, it will improve. I mean, uh, money is coming in. And so uh, uh, the, the big challenge that we all have is that uh, uh, half uh, of the organizations have less of fewer, I would say, than 5% employees with the right uh, skills. So, so training is a, is a big challenge, uh, is, a, is a big challenge ahead. Uh, as we speak, we, we, yes, we face a skill shortage uh, and this, uh, this skill shortage for AI initiatives is, uh, is uh, universal. So, so that's, uh, for, and the rest, I like to, 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 com to compare uh, with the, the, to compare this, uh, this surge of AI with, uh, and uh, the, the, the green revolution with the digital revolution because uh, we we uh, we uh, we can identify the same uh, obstacles and the same uh, and the same potentials and, uh, and opportunities. But again, it's moving fast. I mean, uh, James, we we should uh, we should release this report every six months, and I'm sure that uh, the percentage mentioned uh, would dramatically change. David, would you like to add your um, your insights in terms of what may be acting as a barrier for uh, the wider adoption of AI to uh, to address climate change? Yeah, so I think that some general things are worth bearing in mind if one's thinking about the um, how to have the most how to have the most impact here. And I think uh, first thing that I would I, I would remember is that tech can often be greenwashing. It's very easy to 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 feel oneself like one is having an impact if one uses shiny new technology, and sometimes that is absolutely necessary and absolutely useful. Look, I'm. I'm an AI professor. I think that AI is really useful, but it's important to remember that just because one's using the shiny new technology doesn't mean that it's necessarily having having a good impact. And it's great. It's also really good for distracting you from from maybe lower tech ways that you might also have an impact. Um, so I think it's it's really worth remembering that AI is not always necessary. 
Um, one should try the lower tech solutions first and then go on to using the higher tech solutions. Um, and that will also help drive the, you know, help you apply the AI in the ways that it can be most impactful. So going, going and making a smart building is really important if you're building a new building. But if you have an old building, insulating it properly is probably a, a lower technology, lower cost way to have a high impact. Um, so that's 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 maybe uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, a contextual point, but um, relatedly, I think that if one is using technology um, and AI or machine learning technology, um, remembering that the impactful applications are often not sexy. Um, so, uh, for example, predictive maintenance—it's um, not the kind of thing that makes headlines to say that you prevented a problem using AI, but that can save a lot of emissions. It can save a lot of money. And it can be really impactful. Um, so just remembering that the things that are most flashy are not necessarily the things that are most impactful. And then the, the, the final point that I would that I would add is just really it's, it's fundamentally important to work with experts in the whatever the domain is related to quantifying the climate change impact. So making sure that you actually understand what the effects are of the of the applications that you're that you're um, making, the the actions that you are taking. Because sometimes, as with the case of, of self-driving cars, there are these complicated longer-term impacts that it can be difficult to quantify, um, but that really do have uh, a major effect upon, um, upon the world and society downstream. Um, so recognizing that sometimes these things, these things are complicated. Um, yeah. Thanks, David. And, and Hannah, we were talking last week about you know, while technology is part of the answer, there's a there's a human dimension as well. Um, would you like to perhaps unpack some of the uh, some of the human dimension, which may be holding people back or holding AI back? Yeah, absolutely. So I also confirm that we can expect um, a stronger uptake of the of those technologies still humans they just have a hard time adopting to those new opportunities and 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 uh, yeah chances so whenever we are wondering why humans don't behave rationally and uh, given the numbers and the science uh, that would mean massively investing into green technology and changing our lifestyles at the same time radically yeah then we're catching ourselves totally misunderstanding actually our own nature and, and psychology um, th there is a reason why the human brain is hardwired the way it is. Um, when you look back in history, our self-interest being short-termed and craving for social status is uh, what made us survive. And so those are so those traits are actually our strongest skills, and we should be smarter in uh, using them for what we want to reach now instead of refusing them and simply repeating that general need for humans to think and act more long-term. So the question is, uh, how can we use our short-termism to nudge us into behavior that uh, does not have this destructive long-term effect? Or how can we harness this huge power of our self-interest to build status through um, modern forms of sustainable business models um, shaping a new culture? So I believe we will see only um, a full uptake of the technological potential if we finally acknowledged, if we like it or not, the nature of us humans, uh, of, of, of us human beings and utilize it to build bridges between what motivates us, what drives us, and what we need to do to limit global warming to 1.5. Fantastic, and that's a, a great segue in terms of where, where we go next in terms of the so learning from some of the um, the recommendations and the learnings of the report. And, and, and Cyril, perhaps you'd like to uh, reflect on uh, the lead, some of the leaders which are getting this right and what can we learn from perhaps the, uh, the sectors that are doing best in this area? I think, I think we should avoid the trap or uh, what the leaders are showing, are saying, because we are frankly at the very, very uh, beginning of uh, of this uh, of this uh, trend it's not even the end of the beginning as we said a few years ago so let's be prudent but i think there's something that is so important uh we need a, a collaboration between uh, climate specialists uh, engineers ai specialists entrepreneurs so i think the the world uh, ecosystem 
has been invented for the, the topic we are considering uh, today. And governments, of course, to uh, use our collective knowledge to, to make it happen. I think it's so important. So when I was mentioning previously the, the, the governance, I mean, of course, the governance of uh, those topics need to uh, incorporate the, 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 the management of the ecosystem. And it's not, we should make even find another uh, uh, world than, uh, than manage the ecosystem, but uh, live with this ecosystem, integrate the ecosystem, breath the ecosystem, because it's so, uh, it's so important. So, so that needs to be incorporated in the, in the, uh, in the governance. And what you, you will read in the study is that surprisingly, uh, less than half of organizations work with tech startup well, less than a third collaborate with uh, NGOs or uh, academia for climate action uh, initiatives. So that's uh, that's my key uh, that's my key message, uh, and that, if I may say, that's what we learn from the from the leaders, James. Now my turn to be on mute, and thanks, Cyril. And picking up from that point, um, in terms of entrepreneurs and and collaboration, Hannah, your organisation um, very much uses AI. And, and particularly around, I think, um, use the term temperature alignment to, to help organizations align their, um, their strategy to climate science. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, what we do, as, as you said, is temperature alignment analysis. So we calculate um, the contribution of a single economic entity to global warming under different scenarios. And the temperature alignment, so the tangible degree Celsius number that expresses the climate impact of a company or a country or a financial portfolio or a division, is calculated based on the economic emission intensity that also played a big role in the report. So the economic emission intensity is expressing how much emissions a company, so let's stick with the example of a company, needs in order to create value. Um, and that is the same logic as we can read in the Green Deal. So the Green Deal wants companies to decouple value creation from resource use. So we need a decoupling of emissions and economic growth, be it positive or negative, that doesn't matter at that point in time. Um, we just need this decoupling of emissions and value creation so that the current economic system is learning to be economically successful without using a resource which should not be available in the future anymore. And um, to detect those companies that actually do a good job in this, temperature alignment is a, is a very powerful tool. Interesting. Interesting in terms of um, that, that way of looking at things. I'd like to um, take one of the questions we had from, the, um, from, from listeners. And um, we know that uh, Microsoft and Amazon have both um, uh, being criticized by gender biased um, uh, AI. And I just wondered if anybody had any observations in terms of uh, climate change biased AI and how we might uh, make sure that our models uh, don't fall into the same trap. Maybe I can weigh in here. Um, I can give a fleshed out example of what happened with one application in, in Amazon. Um, so Amazon tried to create an automatic uh, hiring algorithm. Maybe it was a promotion algorithm. Um, and um, as, as people are aware in tech, there is often a gender bias um, in, in hiring and promotions. Um, and Amazon said, okay, we're not going to have gender bias. We're not going to let the algorithm see gender. And so the algorithm learned a hundred different proxies for gender, where it was able to work out the gender of somebody based upon other characteristics in their resume and was able to be extremely gender biased because it had worked out how to replicate the biases that it was being trained on in the human generated data. So this is an example of how if the data that you feed into an algorithm is biased, it will learn how to be biased, even if you try not to have that happen. So it's very, very much an issue in climate change applications as well, in particular if one's data is coming from certain parts of the world more than other parts. Uh, I'd, love, I'd love for the other panelists to weigh in here. Um, there aren't quick fixes here. Some of them involve research on things like transfer learning and meta learning, which enable one to uh, gain, gain as much information from one data set and transfer it over to another data set. Uh, but it's, it's a really hard problem. 
So I can just underline this. I think we don't even have a good overview yet where the data that we feed into our models are biased and where they are okay. I think we're just starting to understand um, how, uh, yeah, how, how we can assess the data quality of those material um, uh, data sources or the, the, the material data that is fed into those models, such as emission data. We have this difference between self-reported emission data and then um, emission data, which is modeled by third-party providers. However, that modeling is based on the reported emission data and then the allocation to different sectors that is uh, a necessary step to model emission data for gaps that we observe in the um, emission reports of companies. So. I think this is now starting and this is very, very good that data quality is being questioned because that brings the methodology of artificial intelligence on the radar as potential tools to increase the data quality. The big question is here, where are the largest sources of uh, uncertainty? What is the What are the patterns and how can we resolve this? So in terms of emission data, and I would refer to this as the as the most important data point for understanding temperature alignment and the climate performance, um, we're at the very, very beginning of, of, of understanding this. That's really interesting. And as you say, it sounds like we're, we've got a long way to go on, on this particular journey. Thank you for the question. Um, a question for, for Cyril, but also for, for Hannah and David, do chip in. Um, with um, the world having changed quite a lot this year in terms of where people are working from, and the fact that uh, many people are now working from home. Do we need to move away, when well, we start talking about smart buildings, do you see a, a real trend growing in terms of uh, smart buildings and smart automation at home as well as in the office? Uh, I think um, a, a quick uh, answer on that. I think people who are thinking, you know, the, the, the way we are managing the energy in the future, uh, think about decarbonization, think about uh, digitization, and uh, they think about decentralization. So it's all, we, we call it the 3D uh, strategy. And yes, uh, uh, AI is at the heart of decentralization. So yes, it will, it will help, I would say, to uh, micro-manage uh, the networks and the grids. So we come back to the, to, to the first uh, examples. So uh, yes, it's a, it's a, it will be a strong lever in the future. And I take your just take your opportunity because I, I see a, a question from Charlie Hamilton on the on the flow uh, regarding the, the the question on the governments. That's always the same question: Are the governments doing enough uh, to support the development of uh, of new AI solutions? I think it's the answer that we share with uh, with uh, David and Anna is it's all about the ecosystem. So uh, they will not, they, you know, that the, the the U.S. elected president makes strong announcement and has a strong program vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, the energy transition and, and AI. Uh, it's massive, but uh, it will uh, it will work with an ecosystem of uh, of uh, of players. So I think it's. Uh, uh, in this in this challenge, we are all uh, would say uh, we have to be all united, and we are all aligned to find the right uh, to, to to find the right uh, solution. Sorry, James, I I, I left the decentralization topic for a while. No, that that makes sense. We were before we answered a couple of questions. We were we were talking about the the barriers to um, to uh, a more effective rollout of uh, AI to act against uh, climate change. Um, David, is there anything else that you'd like to share in, in this space? And I know, Cyril, we were going to talk a little bit about the, the, the shortage of skills as, as a one particular one particular area. But uh, let me go, um, David, and then, then Hannah and Cyril do jump in as well. Sure. So I think that um, touching on themes that people have already brought up, um, I think it's really important to have many different stakeholders in the room. And that involves stakeholders from the private sector, from the public sector, some policymakers it involves AI experts and climate change experts or experts in the particular climate relevant domain um, that, that is relevant to the particular application at hand. It also involves community stakeholders. So if you're working on, um, for example, a project in agriculture, you want to bring in the communities that will be implementing that. The, uh, you want to remember also to bring in you know, smallholder farmers. Um, and really making sure to include diversity across many metrics 
Um, that also comes back to some of the, the questions of bias. That is one way forward that really cannot be cannot be emphasized enough that bringing everybody into the same room and making sure that one is not just listening to opinions from certain from certain sources that's the way to be impactful that's the way to get buy-in from everybody um it's also you know when one needs to one needs to have some amount of literacy in-house ideally um but that's not a replacement for 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 conversations with other people and i think it is really important you know if you're an expert in climate change here go find out a bit more about ai if you're if you're interested in applying ai technologies if you're an expert in ai or tech go find out more about climate change um, and specifically, you know, remember that these things are really complicated. There are no quick fixes. And I think, I, I think also, you know, thinking at the right scale, it's really, it's really, um, there, there are small scale changes, which aren't necessarily the most impactful, you know, recycling that bottle is not going to save us from climate change, but at the same time, trying to come up with an AI solution that's going to be the magic bullet that's going to solve everything is also not going to solve climate change because there's a reason why this problem hasn't been solved. It's really complicated. There are a lot of factors involved. So thinking at the right scale and bringing all the stakeholders into the room. Interesting. And Hannah, are you finding you can get the, the right people with the right skills or is that a, a challenge? Yeah, absolutely. I would like to add two points here. First of all, in the report, um, it says that 84% of the interviewed decision makers prefer offsetting instead of investing in technologies to reduce um, their emissions. And I think that is something that is underlining very much what David was saying. We don't have those interaction right now. Otherwise, those people would know better that you have much, much more valuable options that also innovate your business model and then make you really fit from a, from a business perspective for the future. Um, investing money into offsetting is potentially not the best investment that, that you can do when we think about, again, um, when we think again about the required decoupling of emissions and economic growth. So you should rather put this money into business model development measures that make sure that your economic success is less and less based on an emission intensive foundation. And I think this result in the study is really underlying the necessity for what David was just talking about. And then when we all come together in one room, we certainly want to speak in one language. And I think here we also um, need to find this kind of language, or we have found it already. It's the 1.5 degrees. That's the goal. Um, uh, global warming is uh, caused by emissions. Um, the, the, the temperature increase is something that we find very, very interesting as a very interesting option for this common language that we can all align behind at that methodologies to measure progress and to measure status quo and to measure the effectiveness of technologies um, should be also like um, looked at. So it's this one language um, and it is... Uh, and it is certainly this quite stunning result of the study that 84% would prefer offsetting. And I think that's a huge misunderstanding. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that's a really clear, clear finding. That's music so, to James Hears, who is in charge of this topic at Capgemini. We are absolutely, absolutely, Cyril. Taking, uh, I would say, a uh, trend. So we just have uh, a couple of minutes left. So perhaps we could go around the, um, the table, as it were, and just share um, a last thought or a last um, suggestion um, from, from each of your perspectives. Who would like to, uh, who'd like to kick off first? So I, I like thank you, I like to insist on the on the on the ecosystem uh, ecosystem play, and uh, and now we are entering a new in a new era of maturity for for AI. The the, the impact of AI uh, on the climate change is proven. So so uh, it's all about uh, define the right action plan, and it's if I say with very simple words, it's about uh, execution. But as Anna as Anna said, let's make sure that each and every one speaks the same language, I mean the 1.5 degrees uh, target. Hannah, do you want to go next? Yes, sure. Yeah. So what I, what I would like the participants to take home is a little exercise. So the TCFD wants us to use scenario analysis for understanding uncertainties. And I want to refer to this uh, result again, 84% of decision makers prefer offsetting. 
So why don't you do this exercise to run a scenario analysis? What if offsetting prices go up to 80, 90, 100% for a high quality offsetting projects? And what would be the break even point for your preference shifting from offsetting to actually investing in real emission reductions in your own operations that at the same time develop your business model into one which is working, which is which is functioning in a well below two degree world. And I think that an analysis, which like institutions like the TCFD want us to do now, would be really insightful um, also when it comes to making use of the results that we put together in this report. Fantastic. And David, a final word from yourself? Talk to people. Uh, learn learn about what the, the problems are, what the opportunities are, and remember remember that the there there is a lot there are a lot of opportunities here and think at the scale of how you can use what you, your particular kind of leverage um, in the best possible in the best possible way um, don't try to solve don't try to solve the whole problem um, but think in terms think in terms of maximizing of maximizing your impact whether that is by using air or other tech or 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 not um, and again talk to people um, find out find out from other people what their perspectives are and what what has already been done fantastic and well i think that's really important because i think one thing which i've i've really learned myself through this the process of getting ready for this um this webinar today is that the majority of ai people i think probably don't understand sustainability and the majority of sustainability people don't understand ai so i think this has been a a really great opportunity to to start that dialogue and, and hopefully um build from here in terms of a um, a one and a half degree world outcome. So I'd like to thank the panel. I'd like to thank Cyril Garcia, Hannah Helmke, and David Rolneck, and uh, wish you a very good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. The future. You can't always see what's coming, but the decisions you make right now help you build a better one. Do you want a future where technology constrains your business? or empowers it? Will you innovate for the sake of it? Or innovate so you're closer to your customers? Partner with Capgemini now and unlock the value of technology to transform your business. Capgemini. Get the future you want.